for uh, wolfing down your beautiful chocolate cake. It was really good. <clears throat> I want you to know that this is the... Um, my main vo I, this is the first time I've spoke pu publicly as vice president, except at a council meeting. So this is kind of a, a, a new experience. A new experience for me. Um, and uh, I was elected last May at the Senate Assembly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, but I didn't take office till August, so I haven't been doing it that long. Uh, I, it wasn't something I expected to be doing in my pandemic retirement. Uh, but uh, here I am, and I'm glad to be on board and uh, learning every day uh, about uh, uh, this role as well as uh, things I never knew about the ELCA. <clears throat> and as you all know, I'm speaking to a lot of old hands here that uh, we, uh, since the beginning of the ELCA in 1988, so that's been, what, 34 years now? Seems like only yesterday. Um, that was about the time that the Nilsons came to town, wasn't it? Just around that time? Yeah, yeah okay. 91. Yes, I remember. And uh, that, uh, that we organized into th what we call three intersecting, interconnected expressions of the church. There's the congregation. Uh, there is the synod. And then it's also the church-wide organization. And we are each the church when we meet. Uh, as you probably know, a synod assembly is May 9th, 10th, and 11th. We had to, we moved it from, it was supposed to be in El Paso. So it's been a huge lift to move it to, a, to another location. So what they actually did was switch venues because we're supposed to be in Loveland next year. So we're going to switch back to El Paso. Uh, in 2023, um, if everything goes <clears throat> according to plan. And uh, so the, the Senate Assembly, where people are voting members, you know, we used to use terms like delegate and representative. When the church meets in, in the Senate Assembly or it meets in the church-wide assembly, it is that body in and of itself. And, and people who attend uh, coming from synods, uh, our voting members, it's the same thing we do with people from congregations coming to the Senate Assembly. You're a voting member. And so you are there to vote your conscience, that sort of thing. You're not representing your congregation. That's a little bit different concept than, than uh, some folks understand those kinds of events. <clears throat> the word synod comes from a Greek word to travel a common road, to walk together. Congregations, the peoples, and the ministry of our expansive geographic area are, are the, in the Rocky Mountains is the Rocky Mountain Synod, which includes most of Wyoming, not all of it. There's some northern counties that are part of the Montana Synod, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and El Paso, and the surrounding counties where the prairie dogs live. You know, there's not much out there. Um, and uh, and I, I found an interesting uh, statistic when I was looking for some information the other day that the Rocky Mountain Synod includes 20% of the land mass of the contiguous lower eight, 48 states. So that's... The only, there's only one synod larger than we are, and that's Alaska. And, but that doesn't really count because the Alaskan congregations are all down by Juneau and the Fairbanks and all, I mean, all that area. They're not out in that other area, but we're all over the synod, all over the territory. So it is, uh, it's, it's, uh, some folks from synods like, uh, St. Paul or whatever, where they just have, they, everybody goes home and sleeps at night in their own bed, where our staff and bishop and other folks don't get to do that, although we've been doing things remotely during the pandemic. We have 159 congregations, 10 campus ministries, three outdoor ministries. There's a new one uh, that's uh, just coming online. That's Messiah Mountain. It's going to be an adult retreat center. Uh, they're just, if you wouldn't, 
keeping track. They're remodeling the main building there and uh, doing some things around that. It's really, I've been there several times. It's a short drive from Denver, so we're hoping it gets a lot of use. It used to belong to Messiah Lutheran Church in Denver, and they gifted it to the Synod. Um, so we have two public policy offices. We're the only Senate that has two public policy offices, and we have since 1984. And uh, we have social ministry organizations, the Office of the Bishop, the Senate Council, and uh, we are part of Region 2. There are nine regions in the ALCA, and we are part of Region 2. They come, they start on the... East, uh, west coast and go back east so one and two are out here and then nine is back east so it's sort of like an uh, old highway system um, and as we are a collaboration of our expressions we also have nine con I mean ten conferences within the synod so divided uh, geographically and I don't ask me to name them because I'll leave somebody out. But in New Mexico here, we have the North New Mexico Synod, which is everything north of, uh, of T or C, actually, and, um, and including Durango. Uh, so the congregation in Durango is part of the North New Mexico Synod. Uh, conference, and then we have the border conference, which includes everybody in the south, as well as the four congregations that are in El Paso. So, um, <clears throat> a total of 22 congregations in, in New Mexico, plus the, the four in El Paso, and the, the one in uh, Durango. So that's that's kind of our territory with our two conferences. Um, <clears throat> each conference has a dean. Uh, and some here, I hear the North New Mexico Conference has co-deans. <laughs> Not meant to put you to sleep or stop your cough, but they're co-deans. Um, and that's uh, Kristen Schultz and uh, uh, Nicolae Ferry from Los Alamos. Kristen Schultz from All Saints. <clears throat> and so that's how we're organized. The Synod Council uh, meets... It's been it meets monthly uh, via Zoom, and I don't think that's going to stop no matter what happens with the pandemic. I think we're our Zoom world is here to stay in terms of of meeting and that sort of thing. We found I think people I don't think it's certainly optimum, uh, but it's certainly in in uh, a good way to save money as well as to get some work done quickly without people having to to travel and. Uh, we meet monthly for try to keep it short to an hour or so. Um, we met for only a half an hour this week, which is good. And we have to have a 15 minute meeting next week because something came up. <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing that came up. Uh, if you are aware of, uh, of our congregations in El Paso at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Pastor Rosemary and at Crystal Ray, they're starting a new, uh, event, the, the ELCA has approved a, I always get it wrong, it's a sock of a worshiping congregation that's a, that, that are just getting going. And Pastor Juan de Dios is going to be the pastor. And so we have to meet, the Senate Council has to meet for 15 minutes on Tuesday night to authorize the call. Since it's all been approved, he's just been, or so he can get ordained, so he can start. So he's just finished up and, uh, and all, everything's been approved for that. Uh, it has a name in a Milagro, I think, is the name of the congregation. Yes, yes, there'll be Milagro. Miracle. Miracle, yes. And uh, <clears throat> so that's uh, because the, the Senate Council approves some calls, not all. Obviously, congregational calls are, are approved by the congregation, but if it's this kind of mission developer, you're called by the Senate Council, not by a congregation. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the mechanics. Um, for most of our lives, and we think, we say um, the Synod. And when we say that, what do we mean? We mean the office of the bishop, don't we? <laughs> okay. Those people, 
in that office. Well, that's not even accurate. It's the office of the bishop in the synod. We're all in the synod. So the office of the bishop uh, is in Denver. It's in North Denver. It's barely in Denver. Uh, and uh, it's just south of 36 as you go down, if you haven't been there. It's in a former congregation, American Luther Church, that uh, deeded up their property after they closed. Uh, and we, so we have a property to deal with for years. The, the office of the bishop was a, in a rented location, so, but we own this building. So that comes with its own maintenance and all those things. As everybody knows in a congregation, we have that. And so we're explore, also, uh, we were exploring and we will keep exploring now that things are, are hopefully lightening up on, on the pandemic front. To, to use the space more. We had a group that was a homeless group that was using it, but they're not using it now, and we're looking for other ways to use the space and uh, exploring that. So that's part of what we're working on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what does a vice president do? Well, yeah, I preside over Senate Council meetings and, uh, and the executive committee, which meets... Has, the executive committee does what is assigned to it, but also sort of acts as the personnel committee. And so if there's staff questions and those kind of things, we, we have to, we will uh, be involved in that. And then uh, I also obviously work with the bishop. Uh, I, I guess I can say that. No, actually, I better not say that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I forgot I was being taped. <laughs> <laughs> No, I do. I do. I would. I, I actually wouldn't be doing this if if, if Jim Gonia was not bishop at this point. I would. I would not have consented to do it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I also serve on the regional council. The region two has a council, so I serve on that. And so far, that's bent by Zoom. I don't even know there's a meeting scheduled in a few months. I don't know if that's going to be live or what. I haven't heard about that. But because the region includes. Uh, five synods, the Sierra Pacific, the Southwest California, Pacifica, Grand Canyon, and, and uh, Rocky Mountain. So, <clears throat> so, so those are the, the tasks that I have in front of me. But I also, uh, this is the, purp the purpose of the synod and the council functions, the council is the board of directors of the synod. And we serve as the interim legislative authority between meetings of the Senate's assembly. Uh, when we're everything that has to do with the board, we are responsible for fiduciary and and uh, trustee things, all those things that, that boards do. We are entrusted with. Excuse me. And uh, we issue, as I just said before, we issue letters of call to those in specialized ministry. We work with the ELCA, we work with the staff, we meet, we meet with the staff. Uh, uh, bishop Gonio, when he came in, it's been 10 years he's been bishop, um, and he has two more years, and that's it. <laughs> he's not running for re-election again. So two years from now, we will be in the midst of electing a new bishop. And um, he... The <clears throat> no, there are none. There are in some synods, but not in this one. But but he when he came in he said no more than two, yeah, yeah yeah Alan served three, Bishop Bjornberg, um, and uh, we have to oversee the assembly all those kind of, you know the, sometimes it can be bureaucratic but at times it can be really exhilarating. Um, Bishop Gonia involves the staff very much. Uh, they're nearly always at least if we meet. In person, usually the, almost all the staff is present, um, and uh, that helps with collaboration and envisioning and that sort of thing and keeping up with what's happening. So um, if you look on the website, somebody said, oh, gosh, you have a lot of staff. Look at that. Well, almost all of them, I think there are like five that are full-time. They're, they're part-time folks. And by that time, there's some of them that are, work 20 hours a month. So that's a very part-time, five hours a week on some things. So there's a lot of folks involved, but that doesn't mean, and it all has to be within budget, obviously, in order to make that happen. Uh, if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Uh, it might be easier to do that than to 
tag on a question after we've left the subject. Nancy? <laughs> Not much. I mean, really, it's a, it's a, they get together, collaborate, that sort of thing. They have no power, you know, but it's a way. It, well, there used to be a regional coordinator that was on an ELCA staff. That position went away about four or five years ago, maybe more. And so there used to be that who would organize maybe events and collaborations more. And we don't have that position, so they don't have that. But we they get together. Uh, representatives, the bishop, uh, staff, they do um, uh, first call things together, uh, that sort of thing. So it's kind of an informal collaboration. There's no power involved in it. It's just a way of, of sharing ideas and thoughts and, and your area and, and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. Oh, makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And that happened, that happened, I think, also because of Arizona and the Grand, the Grand Canyon Synod, because I know there were a number of pastors at that time in southern New Mexico who were very unhappy that they were going to be not in Grand Canyon. Yeah, so I <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm shocked. I am just shocked. <laughs> like Casablanca. Oh, there's gambling going on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jan? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. When they had, Yeah. <laughs> and what should we call Are you? <laughs> you know, so yeah. They, and that was the whole region that, that gathered for those discussions. And we do, uh, the bishops, the five bishops get together a couple of times a year, which is helpful for them, just them and their spouses. And they, you know, they get to just as a support group for themselves. And uh, that happens at least twice a year, I think. And uh, Judy, you were going to ask me something? I, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'll raise a local issue. Come in with a deal. Mm -hmm. Where are we? How is, it, how is that something? I haven't been to their advisory meeting in a while, and uh, things seem to be sort of hanging. Well, I guess I don't, I'm not as up on that. I just, is Terry, is Terry the, the, the liaison? Terry Cole? Yeah, yeah. Terry okay. Cole yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, and uh, well, as far as I know, things are going okay. You know, it's uh, that one. If you're not, if you're probably aware, is a, is a partnership with the, with the Presbytery of Santa Fe, and and uh, and so I have not heard anything that and it's not uh, the, the specialized sort of. A, it's a congregation, but it's a, a sort of a specialized ministry, and 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 the spes and the pastor is Presbyterian, so he's not called by uh, by the synod, so it makes it a, a different a different thing like that. But I have not; it's not been on my radar at all about the things that are going on. I'm assuming that Dana Peterson is that's that's some of his responsibility. Oh, oh. A quinceanera. She said we're going to have a quinceanera from. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the staff, as uh, you know, because Pastor Peterson was here recently, and he is the uh, director of evangelical mission, 
and he has all these specialized ministries involved in the one in El Paso and all, all over doing uh, things with the, the bottle white size ministry kind of thing. And, and he's a busy guy, you know. And those were mandated by the ELCA that every synod have a DEM. And uh, there is some talk that maybe folks are not thinking that's a great, I don't know, but there's, a, there's some rumbling, but nothing big. <laughs> and we have had, uh, Dana has been doing it now for like two or three years, I think, something like that. So he's, and he's from um, Colorado, so he's, uh, he, he knows what's going on around here. Now, Mike, I just <clears throat> raised the concern because for 10 years they've been, um, well, mission stated. Um, yeah. Well, the, there, there seems to be no mechanism with the DLCA to continue to fund uh, a mission that never will be able to support itself. And we keep hoping that they can become fully recognized as a congregation. Uh, and, and then we have the complication of it being a joint effort with yeah. the Presbyterians and the Lutherans. And my commitment from the beginning was to see this. Well, I think it is in, in lots of ways. I think the mechanics of it are are uh, are different, but it's and more more ruled by the presbytery, and they do that mission thing for a long time for the congregations. That there are congregations that I think there's one in Santa Fe that was a mission for 30, 40. I mean, that's a, that's they're more comfortable with that kind of polity than we than, than fits in ours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Nancy? When we have the words, we are church together, yeah. not individual congregations. But that's not really true. <laughs> We've got a bunch of old age congregations. What? With <laughs> <laughs> Honey, I know better than you. <laughs> And it's 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 not unique to the ELCA. Oh, that's true. It's 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 all over. And uh, I read an interesting article in the Lutheran this the this week or last week. Uh, I would commend it to you. I forgot what the author was, but he talked about how we're moving from the age of association to the age of authenticity. And it used to be that folks, everybody belonged to, to our church. You know, when I was a kid, there was just, it was just, kind of, yeah, you didn't, if you didn't. And so that has, and, and, and we belonged, to, we had bowling leagues more, and we had the Elks Club, and the, you know, all of those things that we do not have anymore. And I think that, and so all of those things are shifting, and, and so we're having to adapt to it, and we'll, she'll see what the outcome is. And uh, our church is being more, let the mission drive and not the, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's in, it's even in the Midwest, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Holy Land, the Luther Land. So, um, <laughs> I didn't say that. How do you define that? The um, we we are operating the synod, uh, the office of the bishop, the synod council. We're operating under uh, some priorities that were defined a few years ago. We went through strategic planning uh, process, and um, and they they were listed in a different way. And uh, the, uh, Bishop Gonia has has kind of simplified their names with, of our priorities, which I I found a. 
PowerPoint that he had. And, um, and when you look at the, I brought, I told, told Shirley, I brought, I didn't want to scare Shirley because she used to do this every day. You have PTSD because this is the Constitution. <laughs> I have it with me because I use it a lot. And, um, and if you look in our Constitution, there are five pages, five full pages in it of what the bishop is responsible for. There's a lot. I mean, the basic stuff of candidacy and ordination. We've had seven ordinations in this last year in our synod, and that is great. That's higher than, um, I think, any other synod. I heard, I could be wrong, but I think seven ordinations. We have one, uh, and then I will have uh, Pastor De Dios. I'll be eight. <laughs> and um, not some, but most, most, but some, yeah. Most, uh, most of them are, but not all. And then we had uh, 22 installations this year in the last 12 months. So things are shifting, but people come in. People like to be here. And so we do have a lot of pastors I mean, that, that come, want to come and be a part of the Senate. We have a good reputation for, for, for innovation and, and being a good place to be with uh, yeah, that's and so we have that. So that that's helpful for us as well as very good scenery. And um, so, so, yeah, see the, but the, our priorities as together we proclaim and embody God's unconditional love for the sake of the world, and that's been our catchphrase for a number of years. And uh, I didn't. Uh, my printer's not doing so well in color, so I had to do this on. I need a new printer. Uh, but, um, and the way that the bishop had put this together, um, he, was, he was using it to help him shape his thoughts. First, he goes through what he's responsible for, and then how does he get that done? Which things can he do directly, and which ones does he need to hire staff or other people to do so that, that those tasks are done? That's why I said there's five pages. He can't possibly do it all himself. And so... We, 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 we are having an intentional effort around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, Pastor Barbara Barry Bailey uh, has a part-time that in addition to her regular call at St. Paul and St. Paul in Denver. And uh, to work on that and help guide, the, particularly her, her task is to help guide the city council on that issue, those issues and, and uh, do work on that. And then, but collaboration, leadership, identity, generosity, and innovation are the kind of areas that we work on and organize ourselves around. And um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of each one just to, just to give you a taste for it. In identity, we are meant to claim our gifts. Why are ELCA witness, ministry, commitments matter in the church and the world? It's our identity. Why, why does it matter that we're Lutheran? And how does that play out? And then we have collaboration. Where and how do we do church and to get, do it together instead of competing? As with the ELCA and ecumenical partners. Okay, so we're doing more work on that front. And you might, might know that we're also doing with the synods. We're in a partnership with the Grand Canyon Synod on our Excellence in Leadership program that's started. So, in fact, our new person that's going to be working on congregational transitions is a deacon from the Grand Canyon Synod who will also have to mix, I mean, the uh, Rocky Mountain Synod in her, in her portfolio. So that sharing staff between synods is also a way of collaborating as well as uh, uh, making sure that uh, we're using resources wisely. Leadership, how do we help form leaders who are faithful, courageous, and resilient for a changing world in the church? And the Excellence in Leadership program is part of that. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> training leaders and upholding leaders. Innovation, how do we shape our systems and institutions to foster innovation and adaptive change? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so... The, well, that's that's the hard one, isn't it? Yeah, and it's uh, making change. We're not. 
human beings are not good at change. <laughs> you know, and, and then the institutions we create. <laughs> um, I remember, if you all remember um, Steve Werner, who used to live here in Albuquerque. He was from Holy Cross, and he was involved in Lutheran advocacy. And, and uh, there, I suppose that right? Okay, and then, and then he's, he passed on... Um, Oh, it's been five or six years ago. I think he did. And they were living in, back in Virginia, I believe, near, near their kids. And we had lunch when I first took over advocacy. And, and the last thing he said to me at that lunch was said, you know, if there's a problem, look around. There's probably people involved. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, on the upside, the reverse is also true, that if there's great things going on, there's probably people involved as well. But I mean, it's complex. <laughs> but, you know, we tend to take our stuff with us wherever we go. Uh, generosity is the other area of focus. How do we model living from spirituality and abundance and gratitude? Um, and we, we now have a, a staff person who's a development officer, and so that's new. And uh, she also, her other responsibility is, is the facility, <laughs> the Lutheran Center. She has, yeah, Tina, that's part of her purview is managing the things that go on there. Like, you know, the last week I think they had some trouble with some power, so they had to do some, I don't know. <clears throat> it's just like having a house, the joys of home ownership. So um, I... Uh, those are the, the areas that we're working on and try to keep in mind as we do stuff. We do, it's easy to get bogged down in the, in the um, you know, in the, the stuff, you know. And uh, so it's, it's, it's imperative to keep the, other, the, the goals in mind, the, the, the emphasis areas so that we're not just worried about the money we, um, and and we're, actually the Senate is doing fairly well financially. Um, we've had a lot of generosity, and the campaign that the Tina is involved in, the next step. I always forget the, the, the title. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and I, I asked her yesterday for the latest numbers, but we, they were going to raise about a hundred, I mean, one and one point six, and we've we're at we're at the one. So we're moving into the second phase. The first one was like major donors, and now it's more so good to go to two congregations and, in, and another individual donorship. And uh, it's moving along very nicely. People have been very generous, and uh, and so we're using that for for Messiah Mountain. So part of the money is going there. Uh, we're using for excellence and leadership, matching the Lilly Grant. We have a grant from the Lilly Foundation. That's uh, we've had it for three or four years, and it's called 3E. If you've heard of people talk, uh, Michael Tassler is the director of that, and some other folks working with him. And it's mostly to to help pastors. It's, it has money to help you with your loans. Uh, right now, they're they've gotten 30 applications for folks who want to have, after coming through the last two years, they want to take a, a sabbatical, maybe a couple months. And so trying to help congregations be able to afford that without having to hire uh, supply the whole time and that sort of thing. So there's, they have 30 applications for that, which, which means that there's, there's a real need. And so, but that grant has to be matched. And uh, we share it with the, the North Carolina Senate. <laughs> Don't ask. It's a lily thing. They, they decided who we partnered with. We didn't. Uh, but but it, it's working out really well, and uh, but we have to have matching funds, so part of the things go 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 for that, as well as uh, uh, some other projects. So that that's uh, it's uh, I I think you know the Senate is in very good shape in terms of finances and organization. Ten percent of the uh, amount raised has been used for anti-racism. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And work that's called a racial tithe, and uh, the ten percent, and then uh, part of our motions uh, Tuesday night for our meeting will be that twenty thousand dollars from that goes to the new congregation in El Paso, 
to, to support it as it gets going. So we're trying to, to move some money from the tithe over to that project. So, yeah. Oh, well, yes, yes, you, you did. Uh, no, well, well, it's it's just that the, the, the new congregant Juan de Dio, so we, he, we will be calling him on Tuesday night as a SOC, as a, a you know, synodal authorized worshiping community, I think. That, and uh, and so then he can be ordained and, and start. It's called Milagro. And uh, so it's, yeah, so we're, we're moving. We were waiting for the LCA to approve the SOC. So, you know, how that's, <laughs> and, it, and it came up um, just a couple days ago. It was approved. So we had to move quickly to get it done. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but you look at, uh, and this is from the office of the bishop, and you can't see it all, but these are the things that we interact with. This middle part is the office of the bishop, but you have ministry partners, ecumenical partners, city council, churchwide, conference of bishops, region two, global partners, conference deans, rostered ministers and congregations. These are all entities and things that, that, this, that the office of the bishop has to keep track of and interact with. We have, um, I can't find that page, hang on just a second. Um, so I sort of made a list as a way of organizing it so you know sort of what each member of the Senate staff is doing. Obviously, the bishop is doing all his things. Um, and, uh, but he, he has to preach and teach and administer and, and be the pastor to pastors and all of those kinds of things. And uh, Kent, uh, Kent <clears throat> Mueller is on the staff, but he works two-thirds time. He is cut back. Um, as you may know, his wife died at the early on in the pandemic, and he's still adjusting to that. But he does a lot of the office coordination. He is the, he is the institutional memory for the, for the, the so he, he knows where everything is. <clears throat> and he's doing, still doing communications. He's been working with the fire, the fire that was the Marshall fire that was outside Boulder in Boulder County. Uh, a couple of months ago that uh, destroyed two of our pastor's homes as well as that. So he is in the, the Lutheran disaster relief and those kinds of things. He's coordinating some of that along with Peter. <clears throat> and uh, he, he, uh, he also does uh, uh, just interpretation. He's a great guy to have around because he's really good at interpreting, creating really cool charts and things that kind of for, for the visually lear visual learners. Um, <clears throat> the new person is named, her name is Janice Zimbelman. She is the new transitions person, and she is based in uh, Sedona, uh, not Sedona, uh, what's that other place? Uh, Prescott, Prescott or something. No, no, up in the mountains there somewhere. She's, she, her husband's a retired pastor. She's a, a, a deacon, and, and uh, she will be doing con congregational transitions. That's her. And so she has has uh, New Mexico in her, I mean, I keep saying that, Rocky Mountain Synod. Barbara Barry Bailey is full-time pastor, so she's doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And another partnership, we have a partnership with the Episcopal Diocese of Colorado, uh, Father uh, Carino Cornejo. Uh, he is, everybody calls him Q. I don't know. I guess he just gave in to people who try to get us to pronounce his name, but it's it is Quirino Corneo. No, it's not that hard, but I guess other people have a hard time with it. Um, and so he's doing multicultural witness in partnership with the Episcopal Diocese. Uh, Deacon Sarah, Sarah Bjornabo is now doing events, and that's mainly the Senate Assembly as well as the um, the the theological conference. Those are the big events, and she's also part time because she also works in the congregation. Uh, Pastor Diana Lyndon Johnson, who has been in El Paso with, with uh, Peace Lutheran Church, I think, and she is now going to be doing candidacy, first call, roster support, and the global church. So, candidacy is very important. It's a big responsibility of, of synods to 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 guide and and. Uh, 
and go th folks through the candidacy process. We won't discuss that. <laughs> but uh, I know there's some people, the people who, I think there's some looks, I, I heard yesterday on a meeting, I was on call, that there is a group now looking at candidacy and how, and how that transpires. So that would be interesting from the ELC. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, we had another ordination from New Mexico, um, Josh Krenz from Christ Lutheran in, in Santa Fe. Uh, he was just ordained about a month ago. So, and he's in Ohio somewhere. Um, Diana, Diana right now is operating it. They haven't moved yet from El Paso. They, they have a couple of kids, and so they wait until school's out, and then they'll move back up to the Denver area. Tina, we already talked about. She does development, Lutheran Center. And uh, Dana, you've met and are working with. And, uh, of course, we have our advocacy offices when, with Kurt Howe's uh, office, the office here. Uh, and we have two new administrators, uh, a, a gentleman named John Johnson, uh, John Johnson, no, it's not John Johnson. <laughs> he's he's uh, he he's a retired uh, CPA, worked for government, that sort of thing, and and uh, he's doing all the finance stuff. He's we're really really pleased to have him on board. He's very knowledgeable and uh, and and uh, good to work with. And then Yvonne Wilkins, uh, she's done a lot of church work. Uh, she's not a she's worked in churches her most of her career. And uh, she is the uh, administrator who keeps track of, the, the Senate is required to keep track of all people on the roster and what they're doing and all those, all those kind of keeping, <laughs> that's right. So that's, that's in her purview. So they're the new people in the office. They've been there since last summer. And then campus ministry, a part-time position, Pastor Michael Vinson. Uh, Vincent or Vinton? I, I don't know. I may have that wrong. Vincent, I think. Uh, he is uh, has a pastor in Castle Rock. I think that's correct. And so he is going to be, huh? Monument. monument. That's right. Your monument. Yeah, that's right. And so he is doing campus ministry, and just he just started, so he's just getting his feet wet and meeting everybody in that. And but he also has a congregation, and then also a part time position now in youth ministry. Uh, Kenna Nordstrom Kemp, who is doing good work in the in congregation and ministry in Aurora, Colorado, and uh, she has taken on youth ministry. So those are the the main folks who are working now. So if you hear their names and you go, oh, that's that's that person, and so I just wanted to mention those. We still have Sarah Manning is just. Uh, She's given up her transitions thing, so that's Janice Zimbelman has that, but she is still working on uh, excellence in leadership. It's part-time for her. And then Michael Tassler, I mentioned before, who does the Lilly Grant. And um, they, they have been, they've got, he's got several people working for him, and they've done a lot of, just a lot of good work and helped a lot of uh, pastors. It's kind of a quiet thing going on on the side, but... I think their work and, and financial support of some struggling pastors, it was especially start. I think Lily was interested in, in uh, student debt when they first started this project and uh, how many people were struggling to pay off their loans and things. And, and so then it's gotten beyond that. And in fact, it's been renewed a couple times and they say, would you like more money? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> twist our arm. You know, we always have to match it by raising some money to match it. But they're, they're just, they've just been easy to work with. The reports they go they go to meetings and they say, "Well, what are you doing?" They say, "Oh, that's great. You want some more money?" No. <laughs> so it's not like the, your average uh, grant person who's putting you through the, through the through the hoops constantly and looking over your shoulder. So that's what I brought. And so I just, if there are more questions, Nancy. Um, when it comes to looking for candidates uh, and placements, is our Senate putting any emphasis uh, on trying to find people who are bilingual? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, we we do have we, I think we have four 
or five um, bilingual congregations would be El Paso. Now we'll have two in El Paso and then um, Camino de Vida here and then there's two in the Denver area as well. But I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of what you get, what comes out of seminary. So I don't know that's a seminary thing and how, how we're, we're doing that. But, but we had a, um, what was, um, Heffernan, what, oh no, Hef, what's her name? Anyway, she was, she was a vicar in, uh, at Peace, I mean, at, yeah, in Las Cruz, in Al, Las Cruces. And now, she, and she's bilingual and she worked in El Paso. That's one reason she wanted to be there. And then now she's, she's up in one of the Dakotas in a bilingual congregation up there. So we have, you know, I don't know what's being done to encourage it, but there are folks coming through some seminary who want, that is their passion, and that's what they want to do. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just Greeley. Greeley. <laughs> that would fit in Greeley as well, so. Well, if you if you go, we should start in grade school. <laughs> you know, because if students who know who know two languages are much better students, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so there's some emphasis because a lot of time we did that sort of English a second. As soon as you could speak English, then they dropped it. And now the bilingual education in New Mexico is uh, is more the people kids in the program they stay throughout their their until they graduate, so that they keep their, their skills in both languages, and some of them will have folks to, to do it. We yeah. have a church library Yeah, I know, they keep changing, yeah. You know, he came originally from Peru, we thought we had reached mm-hmm. the candidacy in the LCA, mm-hmm. and then the LCA Yeah, he is. Yeah. 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 So no, we we've we've got a long way to go to, you know, because we're one of the, I think we are the whitest church. Yeah. And uh, I mean that's for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I mean that's not for a lot of reasons, but uh, I think that's not the world we live in anymore. And uh, in the. Uh, I lived in uh, Oaxaca as a preschooler. I don't remember living there, except one memory. Uh, but uh, I remember we moved directly from there up to Washington State when I was five years old. And we did speak Spanish around the house, you know, just to turn off the light and come to, you know, those kind of things you say. And, uh, and, uh, and they... The kids there, you know, what are, you know, I, uh, that's why I don't have much Spanish left because I, because <laughs> that was that was just looking at like what are you doing, and I tell folks that, um, and we did we had Mexican things and we were from New Mexico. I remember my mother one time she answered the door, and the, the neighbor was at the door. She said, "Is your family okay?" She said, "Oh, why." There's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> she, said, she said, they're okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, they're fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we, we did a lot of, but we were kind of, we were a small town, so we were kind of, we, we had Mexican things and we had, that we could do. And, uh, and then it was a sundown town. And uh, I remember there was an, an African-American family came to, I was Methodist, and came to church, and they didn't come back. 
they were told at the wor- after worship that they shouldn't be there. You know, that was the 50s. And uh, so uh, the last time I was up there, gosh, I can't remember when, when it was. It's been at least 15 years since I've been back up there. But I was so gratified that my house, there was a family from Jalisco living in my house. <laughs> and I went, yay. <laughs> But still, the neighbor, the neighbor, our old neighbor, she was still living next door, you know. And I, I was walking down the road out in the country, and I said, "Oh, hi," you know. I was like, and she and she started to whisper, "We're out in the country." It's like the houses are like hundred feet, you know. Or so. She goes, "I can't talk to her next door." I said, "Why not?" She says, "I just can't." I said, "I'm sure she speaks English." If, you, if that's the problem, I just can't. You know? So I just, I mean, so it's just, we just do this. I mean, people, you know, it's, it's really hard for, for change and for, and if we don't like to feel uncomfortable, you know, and, and that's an animalistic thing in us. We, we flee from, from fear. It drives us. It's very deep. And uh, so anyway, it's enough about it. That, that part of my life. But um, any more questions or whatever? Bob? Oh, yes. That's going on now in El Paso. Uh, trying to get the the congregations there to to work together, and uh, there's it's kind of uh, they've had a couple of meetings with the congregations, finding ways in which they can cooperate uh, and uh, and do ministry together, and so we're really excited about it. In fact, we just said the other day that maybe it's kind of a good thing we didn't meet in El Paso this time. That maybe next year at this time they'll have really something that we can all uh, celebrate. Uh, going on, as well as the, the new congregation down there. But no, I, there is that kind of effort. I mean, uh, the bishop is very interested in it, and Dana works, they work closely together on that. So some of that's going on in Aurora a little bit. And, uh, and uh, so it's, and so we will, we will see. But, you know, I, th- I, th- I think we're all worried about us and congregations, but and, it, and and because it's happening to everybody doesn't mean we just give up. But I think we we can know that it's not necessarily directly anything we're doing wrong. You know, we do things better and differently, but we didn't. It's it's happening to all the organizations, and we all know that churches in Europe. You know, it's a, and so it's. A, but we were, a, you know, people have written about the history of the United States that. Uh, America, we're joiners. We have been, and now we're not. And there's other things that have taken, taken its place. And so we, we have to adapt. And we'll see. It may not, it may not look like what we know. We don't know what it's going to be like. You know, but as long, but we still have to carry the, proclaim the message. That's that's what's important. So, so anyway, thank you.